Okay. Somehow, some way, here we are. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks podcast. My name is Jay Brown. Who are you? Is this your first time here? If so, hi, welcome. Everyone else, glad to be with you again. First things first, let me express my deep thanks to all of you who listened last week to the outro when I was working through whether or not it was foolhardy of me to buy a family vacation to Hawaii on credit with a hope and a prayer that I'm somehow going to make the money to pay for it at some point. (laughs) Well, some of you emailed me, and I'm just so grateful for the support and the encouragement. And one person in particular went above and beyond. Lindy, I know you're probably listening to this. And the gesture that you made, it just, it, it really touched my whole family, myself, my wife, and my daughters. We were really moved by what you did. So thank you so much. And even if you didn't email me or reach out in any kind of way, even if you were just listening last week, and when I was talking about it, you thought in your mind, just do it, Jay, go for it, life's short, you know? <laughs> like, if, if you had that thought, thank you. I did it. I bought the tickets. We're going to Hawaii in June. Whether it's stupid or not, <laughs> we're doing it. And everybody's very excited about it. And I really felt that there were people listening who sent me their good wishes. And it's happened a couple of times on the show where I've kind of been talking out into the ether through this microphone to this idea that there's listeners, there's people out there listening. And I think, hey, if you're out there, send me a good thought and help me out. And, and I feel that people did and I could feel it. And I felt that again. I felt like people were behind me and it was the right thing to do and we're all excited. And when that happens, when I get that feeling from this show, it makes me feel like life is magical. And that's like my favorite feeling. So thank you for listening and for caring and for encouraging me. I really do appreciate it. And... You know, over the last few weeks, if you've been here, I've been talking to a number of different people from different approaches, different viewpoints, different approaches in practice. I've been looking at how I feel like teaching's been evolving and the way that teachers are relating to students seems to be evolving. And In all of that, we've looked at people who were very inspired by BKS Iyengar or Vanda Scaravelli, or last week I talked to Hamish, and we were looking at people who were inspired by the Ashtanga Method, and have studied with Patabi Joyce or Sherrod, and how they've taken what they've learned, or how they're carrying on their practice and their teaching. And what I have been discovering is that And we've known this, this isn't like newly discovered. Actually, I've known this for a long time, but it's just been affirmed that within all of these different traditions and approaches, there's all this individual expression. And so it's very hard to talk about them like monolithic things, even though the methods were kind of standardized in certain ways in the like process of creating certifications and whatnot. So trying to flesh that out and just see where we are in terms of different approaches and styles and recognizing how much they are connected. But I also want to say that there are differences, that there are very big differences between what BKS Younger taught and what Patabi Joyce taught and what TKV Desikachar taught. And anyone who's ever practiced with me or listened to this show for long enough would also know that I am most inspired by the teachings of TKV Deskachar. 
And it's not every day I get a chance to speak with someone who had a chance to study with him directly. Well, today is such a day. My guest is Colin Dunsmuir. And I was not aware of Colin, but a friend of mine reached out and said, hey, maybe you should check him out. (laughs) And I sure am glad I did because I always relish an opportunity to hear some firsthand account of what Desika Char was like and how he taught. And I think we get a good dose of what he was like and how what he was teaching is being carried forth by Colin. So it was great pleasure to connect with him. I'm very glad to be sharing it with you today. Real quick before we get to it, I do want to also express some gratitude to our podcast premium subscribers. Specifically today, I want to say thank you to Thomas Forrester and Deborah Halliday. Shout out to you, Thomas and Deborah. Thank you so much for your long-time support. If you are newer around here and you were not aware, the most recent 52 episodes are always part of the public feed. We do also have a podcast premium subscription, which is how you access the full archives and just support the show and help us keep it going. It's choose your rate. You cancel at any time, and if you don't have money and there's an old episode that you want to listen to, you just email us and we will hook you up. But if you have a little something to give, it makes a huge difference. We're very grateful to everyone who's doing that. To learn more about becoming a podcast premium subscriber, along with all the other stuff that I'm doing, everything can be found at jbrownyoga.com. Okay, y'all. I think that that is fine for now. I will touch base with you on the other side, but I feel like we should just get to it. So we will. Let's go ahead and listen to this conversation that I had with Colin Dunsmere. Hello. Hi, Jay. How are you? Hi, Colin. Pleasure to meet you. You too. Um, I just want you to know, I don't know if you've ever listened to the show before, I'm already recording, and I'd like to consider us having just begun, if that's okay with you. Absolutely fine. Thank you. You're very welcome. And I also want to take a quick moment right here off top to shout out my friend Vicky, who is the reason why you're here. And I don't know if Vicky has studied with you or worked with you or knows of you, because honestly, I intended to have a conversation with her about more specifically why she sent a link to you mm. um, and suggested that you be someone that I speak to, but I didn't get a chance. I meant to email her and talk to her, and it just didn't happen. <laughs> yes. However, here's the deal. In getting okay. ready to talk to you, I think I have an idea why it's maybe like a little bit of a good way to set some context for us as well. Mm -hmm. So Vicky has started to do some study with me. And one of the things that I offer in that program that she's in is I share some about how I got to what I'm doing, because I always, I always think that that's like how people can better understand what I'm doing very Mm -hmm. often. Yeah. Um, if they understand like where I came from and how I got to it, it gives this important frame or something. So just in getting ready to talk to you, I noticed some things about you that are very similar, if not parallel kind of trajectories. You know, I said, I communicated with Vicky in this training that when I look back to kind of like a sort of starting point for me, it was mm-hmm being rushed to the hospital because uh, my mom was dying when I was 16 years old. And then ultimately yoga became like the avenue for me to kind of find my way. And initially I studied Ashtanga Vinyasa and then some Iyengar method. And then I had like a whole kind of crisis and almost left yoga and then eventually became very inspired and sort of found what I needed through the teachings of TKV Deskachar. Yeah. 
We, we have some very, very similar background. Um, That's what I was saying. I, I saw yeah. mention that you had even a similar starting point of being rushed to the hospital as a teenager. Did I read that right? You, you did. So exactly that. And I didn't actually realize, you know, you know, you're not aware of the time, what's going on. You know, you really actually have no understanding what's going on. But rushed to the hospital and discovered I was two hours away from dying. And I had a bleeding duodenal ulcer, and that was actually just through to stress, just purely, purely due to stress. And after that, I spent, I think, a month in hospital, and coming out of it, I was advised to do yoga. And so I ended up doing yoga class after yoga class after yoga class, and I ended up actually doing the Iyengar method first of all. And then it didn't really work out for me, so then I went to the Ashtanga Vinyasa. I've discovered that and ended up doing first and second series of Ashtanga and went to Mysore and did numbers of different things there. And I, I was just about to do a trip to go back to Mysore when I met this gentleman called Karstab Desikachar. And it was very interesting because he inspired me he turned around and said he communicated yoga in a way that had never been communicated before and he said my father is running a training he's running he wants to train yoga therapists would you be interested but you have to come to chennai at this time and for one month to actually see and do this integration to see if you're the right person for this thing with my father so it just so happened that it was exactly the same time that I was supposed to be going to Mysore to do my final sort of stint with Sharat so that I could get my Ashtanga certification. You know, that's the kind of thing that happens. Yes, I, I've spoken to many folks. I mean, what year are we talking and how old are you? Because that process has changed over the years in terms of whether you get the tap on the forehead or whether there was like some other way that you got the, the yeah, authorization, yeah. you know? yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 it, it's back in the midst of, you know, 20 odd years plus years ago. Yeah. Um, How old were you at the time? Do you, what, what sort of like life stage were you in when you were doing this? At, at late twenties. Yeah. And I actually, I did on, on my way to get there, I did nine teacher trainings, um, but I kept teaching <laughs> feeling of knowledge, you know, one of those kind of yeah. people where it, 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 everything needs to make sense to me. And also what I discovered, and I discovered this from Desika Char, is that you can only take someone as far as you've been yourself. Mm. And this was the interesting thing. I kept going, doing all these sort of trainings and, and hitting these kind of ceilings, but at the same time finding myself teaching and teaching and teaching, but also finding that I had a limit with regard to what I actually knew myself. And I'll, I'll tell you, I, I, one of, one of the funniest incidents I had with regard to this was I had this physiotherapist that kept coming to my class. And she said to me, Jay, she said, she said, Colin, you have to come and teach my husband. He's got throat cancer. And I, I can honestly say I was the most avoidant person you could probably meet in your life at that point in time. And every time she came to class, I'd say, yes, yes, of course, of course. And I'd disappear. And then I'd see her and I'd kind of like, I'd think, dread it. I just can't do this. I mean, how can I help this man? I teach Ashtanga yoga. I, I, I had no idea what I'd be doing. Yeah. So she dragged me to her house and said, this is my husband. Please, can you do this? And so as part of this, um, I taught him what I knew, which was just Ashtanga yoga. And he got better. And I thought, I really don't understand, you know, really what's going on here. And that was at the time that I... I mean, it may not have even been the yoga, but it certainly was nice that it, it yeah. seemed to help. Now I understand a lot more. Yeah. And, you know, one of those things where you just kind of look back and you kind of realize how little you know. And I, yeah, knew, sure. I, well, I knew back then. I mean, I sure. really knew how... I mean, I was full of fear and I knew how little I knew. And I didn't want to be exposed, didn't want to be in that situation with that person. And it was at that point I had to make a decision. And instead of going to Mysore, I went to Chennai, went to Madras. 
and I never looked back. And it was all I can say. It was unbelievable, um, and I really mean that by unbelievable because. I remember we were presented with three lists of arsena and I looked at these lists of arsena and we were going through them and we were looking, we looked at them, we looked at them and not just how we look at them in the West, but we looked at them with regard to their function, their function with regard to yoga and also Ayurveda. Mm. And we were studying them and I looked at these lists and I thought, these look very much like the first, second and third series. And so of course me being the way I am, put my hand up and and Desgachar said, yes, this is what my father taught. This is the order that he taught it in. Hmm. I thought, ah, it all makes sense. And so what happened is that it was at that point that I began to really understand a lot more about how these things were built, how they came together. And But the interesting, very interesting thing is that we drilled down into every possible function that you could possibly use each asana for and how it affects the body, how it affects the body from yoga's perspective, how it affects the body, but also how it affects the psychology, and then how you then add different pranayama techniques into it to affect the psychology of the person even more, and then how you add meditative practices into it as well to affect the spirituality. And for me, that was the journey over years and years and years, is to really kind of explore these things. How do we see a person as a person? How do we look at an individual with all their beauty and all their complexity? And how do we take these tools, because they're only tools, and how do we apply them to a person so that that person gets the experience of yoga for them and that it changes their lives? And that's the thing that just really blew me away. Well, I think that is quite intriguing. You know, I've spoken to a lot of as many as I could find, really, people who've had a chance to study with Jessica Char directly. And it is interesting to me the way it seems like he's teaching the same thing, but whether or not it it has like this kind of more chikitsa therapeutic application or whether or not it's just more of a yoga transmission and exchange one-to-one among friends. Mm. Uh it depends on who the person was that studied with him. Exactly. And that was the interesting thing. Each each of us did different things. He focused on different things in different ways. Yeah. And that's what I find very interesting because he gave each of us what we ourselves needed. And in turn, that gave us the ability to help other people with what they need in different ways as well. Now, does that also what distinguishes Desika Char from Patabi Joyce? I would say 100%. It's, um... You studied with him directly, right? You studied with both of them directly. So you know I... firsthand that they, even though, because you said they both are teaching, or like Ashtanga has roots in what Krishnamacharya was teaching, but something changed in it in the presentation or something that makes it different, right? What what changed is the is the is the methodology, mm-hmm. and the methodology is that is is the view. So what's happening is that within Ashtanga Vinyasa, I have a set series of positions, and I evolve through those set series of positions. I I start with Surinamskar A, I go to Surinamskar B, I then have the standing sequence. I then go through standing to seated, and then I do finishing sequence. But all of a sudden, when I started with Desika Char the order of everything changed. Like, you know, the order of the, the inversions at the end of the, um, mm-hmm. of the practice. Yeah, he puts them in the middle instead of the end, right? Yeah, but not only that, dependent how you change Vipriti Karani, Shishasana, and Sarvangasana, you can either increase mass, decrease mass, or balance out the system. We learned stuff like this, and it just blew my mind. Mm-hmm. And, and then how do you... How do you order a practice so that the practice becomes an energetic practice and it defies all the rules that you learned with regard to how you set things up? And these were the things that actually, they're mind-boggling. And and that's it was his understanding that was very different, very different. And I guess 
I guess I'm curious about the different kind of um, learning process because a lot of folks I know just had like one-to-one lessons and then Desika Char gave them practices to do and then they would check in with them now and again. Mm. Other folks like went and lived there mm. and got to be doing stuff regularly. It seems like maybe this program that you went in was also one where it was much more, um, I don't know, would you say standardized? I guess that's my question. A lot of these systems of practice started out as one thing, you know, like in the 70s, 80s, Mm -hmm. (laughs) 90s, and then got standardized over time. And because Desika Char's sort of signature is this individualization, like each person has their own yoga, and it's not like a method that is being imposed on you. At least that's my understanding of it. Definitely. Um, It does seem like I don't know that when in the training that you did, what was the actual experience? Were you just like going on rounds and observing people working one to one? Were you doing sessions and they were giving you all this Ayurvedic information? How did the study go? What I discovered is that you could, the more you asked for, and you could, it, it was all about what you asked for. Mm-hmm. Most people don't know what they want, and they waited to be taught. Mm. And that was the key thing is, yes, we went into, let's say, a therapy program. And yes, I was one of the first people ever to do an internship at the Krishnamacharya Yoga Mandaram. Yes, you experienced all these different things. But what you asked for became very important. Mm -hmm. I remember I, I, I was awful at everything, first of all. I remember being really bad at chanting because this is one of the funniest things in the world is that we had to learn yoga sutra off by heart line for line and you know for someone who's was very uncomfortable with themselves originally and also uncomfortable with a voice and expressing themselves it, it was really really difficult thing to do to actually learn each sutra each chapter one two three four but to also to understand what they actually meant in real life now what this meant is that i asked for extra help i asked for help with regard to yoga sutra i studied bhagavad gita with menika his wife um it it means that i actually decided that i wanted to go on a journey to get as much as possible so that i could be the best possible support for those people that came to me so it wasn't just the program it was what you asked around that program that became important and how you how you were how you interacted with other people around you does that make any sense yes it makes perfect sense and it it confirms a lot of what i've heard about desika char i remember even seeing a, a video of eric schiffman talking about this as well where people would have these opportunities to study with desika char one-to-one and for like some uh, like while some period of the first sessions it's like he never taught them anything and they'd be Mm -hmm. thinking why is he not teaching me anything we're just like hanging out having tea all the time and just like and then finally they would they would realize at some point that if they asked a question he would Mm -hmm. go on for hours (laughs) so he it really he was looking for it to come from you and that is very different often than the dynamic these days where People yeah. come with an expectation that you've got a lecture or whatever. And yeah. and I think it's been interesting, those of us who are inspired by Desika Char, to find ways to get to this dynamic where it comes more from the student because that's really what Desika Char taught too, isn't it? A hundred percent. And I, I, remember, I remember when I first went over there, um, it, it was at a Christmas time and I, I booked to go over there for a month and so it's sort of beginning of beginning of December through to sort of mid-January I thought I'll go over there and I'll do an internship at that point so I, I turned up at the Mandaram and I said that you know I'm here to do an internship which means that I'm there to observe what's going on participate in the therapy process that's happening there with all of the case studies that are coming to the Mandaram for yoga therapy and to observe Desika Char working there, to observe all the other practitioners working there, and also to teach there myself. And I arrived there, and I kind of like, uh, it was a bit sort of, you can imagine, just a little kind of like, hey, I'm here, you know, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And you 
find yourself in Chennai in this big hot city which is really kind of roasting and you're sitting in the an entrance way of this place with a, a fan that is making that squeaking noise as it goes <laughs> round and you know there are mosquitoes everywhere and, and you sit down and you just start perspiring incredibly and I'd announced my presence to the person at reception who'd wiggled their head at me and said please come sit down and I thought I'll just sit here and I, I must have started being there at sort of nine o'clock in the morning or eight thirty or something like this, sort of expecting to go in and you know start immediately. And it got to lunchtime, and I went up to the desk and said, "You know, any news of what I'll be doing?" And they said, "Go for lunch and come back after lunch." So I went for lunch and came back after lunch, and then I waited there the whole afternoon, still the squeaky fan going round, and I got very used to reading the different Madras papers that were there as well, the Chennai Times, amazing, amazing, amazing newspaper. And at the end of the first day of sitting there, um, there was no discachar, there was no one to take me in, and it, it was just a little bit kind of aggravating, just a touch. They said, please come back tomorrow. <laughs> So I went home, went back to this flat that I kind of I had and just, you know, it was everything was hot and I had to walk all the way from the Mandaram all the way to through Mylapore, all the way to the, the beach where I was staying. And I remember just doing that walk in the morning back again, thinking, yes, today's going to be the day. But guess what? The same thing happened the second day, the third day, the fourth day. And I realized as I was going through this that what was being is exactly the same as the other people that you'd spoken to, where you just sit there and you have tea and you wait, is that you're being tested. You're being observed very clearly about how you respond to various different things. And this was the other interesting thing about Jessica Chai, is he, he tested you. He really tested you. Not in the ways that you thought, but in very, very difficult ways that actually bring up lots of stuff for you. And I remember going through this and, and just actually finding some kind of patience and sort of sort of actually accepting the whole situation and realizing it was a big test and just enjoying the Chennai Times and enjoying meeting people in the reception and talking to lots of people until finally on the Friday, please, Colin, come in. <laughs> now, here's my question. Do you, mm. do you really think this was like a, a, a clear strategy. I mean, clearly the experience and I've been to India once and I had similar kinds of experiences. And I guess my, <laughs> I think my curiosity is the, you having to wait there. What I, I hear is that it, it broke down like whatever kind of expectations you came in the door with in a sense, yeah, so is. that you actually entered into that meeting in a much more open place you would you had to let go of whatever expectation you were thinking was going to happen and then you were just sort of grateful oh my god i don't have to sit here another day but i guess do you think that because also india just kind of worked on a different time i found like waiting for trains was a similar experience or finding your train because they often weren't <laughs> marked you know so yeah. you had to kind of release into kind of like a flow and momentum of life which is actually something a way I learned a lot about yoga, despite any other classes I took. Mm. But do you think Desika Char was really conscious? Like they said, they came in and they said, oh, this person from wherever mm. the UK, Colin's here to study with you. And he says, okay, we'll make him wait for five days. Or how do you think it went? You, you mean they forgot about me? No, or <laughs> not that they, no, 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 I don't no. know that they, they just, yeah. Desika Char was busy and they just weren't telling you like, Oh, Desika Charge not going to be able to see you till Thursday or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, well, there's several different things here. One is that actually they weren't prepared. The other is that the understanding is that timing is everything. Mm. And this is again the repetition of a big pattern is that how do you, as a therapist or as a yoga teacher, work with someone else? It's all about timing. Mm -hmm. And that means that also it's to do with transitioning because. I needed to transition from one world, which is a world that I was in, into this world. And so these four days actually provided me with the point of transition to move from one point to another point. And this is one of the biggest issues I'm seeing with people today is that we're not very comfortable with transitioning. We can't actually transition very well. So 
for me, whether the lesson was deliberate or whether it was accidental, it actually provided me with a lot of wisdom and a lot of insight. I could imagine so. And so when you finally did get in the door, what was that like? Did you get to observe Desica Chart working with other people or were other people at the ashram? Who did you get to work with? Who was mentoring you? I, I was mentored by a doctor, a um, medical doctor, who was um, also one of the main assistants to Desica Char. Mm -hmm. And so I got to observe Desica Char and I got to observe this and follow this doctor around absolutely everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember there was one incredible lesson. I would sit in the corner with a notebook and I would note every single thing down. So we had this one case that came in and this gentleman came in with x-rays and he came with these x-rays and you know the doctor would pull the x-rays out of the of the sleeve and they put it up to the the whiteboard and Desca child would come in and he'd look at it and look at the person and greet him and Desca child would just give us a couple of notes on the form just to give a direction for the practice for the person and then the doctor would then take it over. But Desika Char would just meet the person just for a few minutes. And then he would know exactly what to do. And that's what I observed. He just interacted. He just met that person. He connected with them at such a level that he just knew. What he did is that he would just jot those notes down. And then the doctor would then take everything over. And the doctor would spend a lot more time talking, asking questions, doing lots of different things, taking the pulse, taking blood pressure, and then take the person through the practice that Desika Char had already set, you know, 40 minutes beforehand. And one of the times that they did this, the doctor turned around to me and said, well, what would you give this person? And so you can imagine I'm in the room there and you've got this person with their x-rays and there's other things going on. You've got... The doctor asking you, what will you do? You've got Desica Char watching. And you just think, crikey. And so I said, do you mind if I come back tomorrow and tell you exactly what I do? You know, I needed to bide some time here. Yeah, you need to think about it a bit. I understand you didn't have it at hand. Exactly. I mean, and, 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 and they looked up at me and they said, don't carry the patient home with you. Yes. Whoa. All right. Well, here's my question. This is actually something I was just thinking about quite mm -hmm. a bit because, you know, and, and maybe we can get to this more in terms of like differences between yoga and yoga therapy, if there are mm -hmm. any, but I guess my, when you say that, when you say Jessica Char came in, he met mm -hmm. them and he knew something. Yeah. Would you say that that is some kind of intuitive process that's more about transformation than information and then the doctor was supporting that with other kinds of information and like context or something yes the first time i saw there's a good child work i was what really inspired me was this is that he i remember there was a lady in front of him and he sat at this table and he put his elbows on the table and he took her hands towards him and took her pulse on both sides at the same time and he looked at her and he was smiling. He had these big eyebrows and I remember him just smiling. And he looked up at her and he said, did you have hepatitis when you were younger? And her face changed and she said, yes, I did when I was much younger. And it was at that point I thought, I really want to know exactly how he does that. But can you know how? I mean, you can know a lot about it and maybe develop <laughs> it for yourself, but can you really know how he knew that? I it mean, was, he was able, he just knew. And like, he knew. He would get me out in a group when we had seminars. He would get me in a group. He knew how self conscious I was. Yeah. And he would get me in a group. He'd say, Colin, take your top off. And I'd be like, oh, <gasps> fuck. take your top off. Do vinyasa to this position and show everyone Uddiyana Banda. And there'd be a group of people, they'd be filmed and everything. I'd be in my head, I'd be like, I'm so embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed. 
please don't do this to me. But it's Sir asking me, so I will do it. And so I do the whole thing. And then I'd shuffle back and he'd go, Colin, so good, so good. And I'd shuffle back to my point in the room. And I realized what he was doing. He just knew. He just knew what every single person needed. He knew what was going on with them because he was able to link with them at a very deep level. He was now, a very special man. Yeah, I've heard this before about a lot mm. of time the teaching would happen in this way where they would kind of, he would mirror something about you back at you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 100%. I mean, but, but, but really, 100%. And it was, it was this, these were the things. And if you stepped up to it, if you stepped up to it, mm. then that was the opportunity. Mm. All right. So here's another question I have then. Having had experience in the Ashtanga Vinyasa, even working your way through the series and then mm. kind of going to look at what Desika Char was doing mm. and saying, you know, s- s- certainly the connection and intersection between those whatever mm. approaches. I've also heard, and it's certainly been my own experience and practice and in teaching that like the use of forms with Desika Char, like tended to be much simpler forms. And mm-hmm. often, like less emphasis on like accomplishing them in any in the same kind of way. And we so when you even told that story about him having you do that demonstration, mm-hmm. he knew you had that previous experience. I'm sure. <laughs> and I guess I'm just curious: was that your experience of seeing him work in terms of the way that he used forms, simpler forms, and? Do you think that has to do with there being maybe kind of a different focus or purpose in the doing of the forms? 100%. The form was there just for the function. So it was the function of what we wanted. So in this, where he asked me to do the vinyasa krama to this different position, he was explaining that this is one set form of doing it. But there are many, many different ways of doing it, dependent on the context and dependent on the function of what you wanted it to achieve. So this is what we learn, is that we learn in one way, how do we protect and maintain a body? How do we evolve a body? How do we reduce fear? How do we build strength and stamina and courage? And all of it meant that the form that we would use would be different. And that was the most powerful thing. It was that in sometimes we were looking at your alignment had to be a particular way. Other times that was completely and utterly ignored. It went by the wayside. It was just very, very simple positions, but also very powerful positions. All right. So how, how long was that internship time when you were there with this, working with this doctor and Jessica Char? So we went through, I think the training and all was about seven years and we go two, three times a year. Mm. And so you'd spend a lot of time. You got to know absolutely everyone. It, it, it was, it wasn't short. Mm-hmm. No, I know it was an extensive process. I know a lot yeah. of other folks who were working their way through it during mm. that time. I assume you were, were you working as a yoga therapist or yoga teacher? And where were you doing that? Was that in the UK? Yeah, it was UK and London. I was working as a yoga teacher, um, and I was also doing lots of one-to-ones at the time. Right. And I guess that's an interesting question about it, because that comes up. You know, my the first time I ever heard the word yoga therapy was mm. I was looking at a yoga journal magazine at a very early time of me coming into being a yoga teacher, and it listed all these different, um, like choose your style. Yeah. And then it would have like a picture of BKS Iyengar at the top and it would say a Iyengar method. And then it had Tavi Joyce at that time. It had John friend. I remember. Yeah. And then at the very end, it yeah. had a, a, the only one that had a picture of two people, Krishnamacharya yeah. and Desika Char, like split. Yeah. And underneath that, it said yoga therapy. Wow. And I had never heard of that. And later on I did spend some time, 
at, at, you know, in, getting involved in some meetings at the IYT for a bit there mm. and kind of trying mm. to suss that out. Mm. And it was sort of interesting to me the way yoga and more specifically, maybe yoga therapy was kind of making its way to the West. Mm. So I guess I'm curious for you in terms of a yoga therapy classification as opposed to yoga, is that more specifically about working one-to-one to people? I assume you were doing both teaching groups and one-to-one. And do you mm-hmm. think of teaching groups not yo- as yoga therapy because it's a group and then one-to-one because it's more focused on them? Okay. So we've got, uh, it's a, such a good question. I mean, it's a really good question actually. Because some people view that all yoga is yoga therapy. Mm-hmm. So this is one perception, one view of it. Mm-hmm. And this Gachar and Krishnamacharya split the view of someone's life into several different areas. The idea of a practice at the beginning of your life, the middle of your life, and then the end of your life. So they split the life up into these different times, these time zones of your life. And then there was a different approach with regard to that. So when you're younger, you learn to do things like Ashtanga Vinyasa. You learn about sort of how do you build courage? How do you reduce fear? How do you get more of a personality? And in the middle part of your life, you're looking at protecting yourself, maintaining yourself, and making sure that you've got the energy to do all the stuff that you need to do in life. And at the end of your life, you then got this phase with regard to spirituality and yoga and spirituality. So they broke it into these areas. And then they had a fourth category, which is called chikitsa. And the role of therapy is to take you back to where you should be in your life. And so that's how they sort of described it. And what this meant for me is, and I've worked in hospice environments, end of life environments, and I've worked in pupil referral units where we have excluded young people, Um, worked in nursing homes, worked in sort of pretty interesting environments. And sometimes group therapy works really well. So in the hospice environment, getting people together in a ward as a group really kind of works very well indeed. However, when you want to apply one-to-one different tools and techniques it means that everyone's practice ideally should be different if you want them to get back to where they should be in their life does that make any sense it does make perfect sense i guess the other part of that for me has to do with the notion of like like some people tend to be a little bit more like prescriptive and some people tend to be more process oriented Mm even within Deskachar teachings, honestly. Like I compare like Gary Kraftsau to like, you know, other <laughs> teachers I've met right. who's definitely saying the same kind of thing that you're saying about yoga chikitsa and mm-hmm. making that distinction. But there's certainly a lot of people who work with cancer patients mm-hmm. who aren't who aren't necessarily diagnosing and prescribing. And was Deskachar even diagnosing and prescribing when he just knew what to do for somebody. I don't know. Like how much of it is a standardized protocol and how is it somebody feeling into the moment and there's some kind of communication that maybe we don't have good words for? He taught us something very interesting. He said the only way that you can work with people and change things is through the Vijnana Maya. It's through their belief, through what they believe have faith in what they trust what their conviction is that's the only way you can change something Mm. and that means that you need to adapt to their level this is the idea of vinyoga. yoga it's that everything needs to be a specific adaption everything and he was really insistent on that and that's all i remember as i just remember that we need to constantly adapt and change we need not to be prescriptive we need not to have a set series of approaches with things of course there are stuff to avoid of so of course there are contraindications of course there are you know there are things rituals that, that you've used that, again and again that have worked again and again whatever but, but, they're, but they're tweaked and the order is different and how you set it up is different because 
each person is different. They come to you not just with, let's say, a stomach problem. But they'll also have shoulder issues or that have had surgery or something in the past. They'll be... If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.